everybody. It's Wednesday, so we are nearing the end of our first unit of the class. So today we're going to wrap up talking about imperative programming, but it's also a chance for me to do something fun because I could talk a little bit about how Java actually works. So up until this point, we've been teaching you about how to communicate with the machine using the Java language, but we haven't talked much about what's actually going on when your Java code runs. We've hinted a little bit at it. You guys uh, looked at the different stages uh, that the, your program goes through a little bit in lab because it's important to understand the kind of error messages that you might receive. But today we're actually going to talk about that in a little bit more detail, and I'll show you a little bit more about exactly what is going on behind the scenes. So we'll start to help us out next week once we start to talk about objects. Okay, but before we do that, I have a few little bits of syntax to clean up. These are sort of, you know, they're here at the very end of this section of the course because they're sort of oddities, but I think they're, they're worth introducing. And it's good review, given that we have a midterm next week. So remember the while loop. That was the first loop that we looked at. It was the first way that we had to have the computer repeat a series of steps over and over again. And the while loop had this form. It had a keyword while followed by a conditional expression that's evaluated every time the loop starts. If that condition is true, I enter the body of the loop delineated by those curly braces. I run whatever code is inside there, and then I return to the top and evaluate the condition again. Okay, so this is our while loop. And again, uh, these, w the, the constructs we're talking about today are here because they're not very common. Uh, but I do want you to see them uh, briefly. So here is a different form of a loop. This is another valid loop you can write in Java. Uh, it's called a do while loop. So you'll see it looks a little bit different. So it starts with this keyword do. There's a body, um, a block, delineated by those curly braces. And then while is at the end. There's still a condition. Um, what do you think this does differently than the while loop? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the syntax here is designed to help you remember what happens. So the condition. When I run a while loop, the condition is at the top. That should help you remember it gets checked before I enter the loop. When I do a do while loop, the condition is at the bottom. It gets checked after the loop executes. So while it's possible for a while loop to never execute if the first time I reach it, the condition is false, a do while loop will always execute at least once. Because it will go through, and it'll get to the bottom, and it'll say, should I keep going? If I should keep going, I run the loop a second time, but I'm always gonna run it. There are times, you know, I'm, I'm uh, bringing these things to your attention because there are times when you're gonna write some code and you'll be like, oh, I'm having to write this really awkward while loop, and oh, right, I remember from years ago, there's this thing called a do while loop, and that would actually clean things up quite a bit. So there are some places where this is helpful. So again, you know, we can run this, uh, run this code here, and we can see that the while loop, so these are two loops that have the same condition. I've initialized a variable called i, and I'm continuing loop y i is less than zero. But i is starts at zero, and therefore that condition starts out false. So I never enter the loop body for the while statement, but I do enter the loop body for the do while. So that's the difference. Okay, good. Now, if statements. So again, these are both sort of expansions or variations, little extra spice added to these things that we've already seen. So you might remember our if statements. We showed you that you can use these to implement conditional logic. This is how computer programs can make decisions. If one thing is true, run one piece of code, otherwise do something else. And I can chain an arbitrary number of conditions together in an if statement. So you'll see something like this. If one thing is true, do that, I'll else if. So I can check a bunch of things. And Java has a variant of this as well. Now, Java's, I just have to point out um, that Java's version of this particular programming construct is not very good. But other programming languages do this much better, and so you'll see this used much more powerfully in languages like Haskell and other places, okay? The version of this is something called a switch statement. So rather than an if, rather than condition, 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 um, in Java, what I do is I say, I'm switching based on some variable, and I write out cases 
for each value that that variable could possibly take. And I think in Java, the variable, this is one of the reasons why this statement isn't very powerful in Java, is that um, you can only put a variable into that condition, and I think it has to be a primitive type. I can't remember, I don't use this very often in Java, because it's not that helpful, but you'll see this in other languages where it's much more powerful. Um, okay. Switch is, again, more limited in terms of what you can check, right? So you can only, ch okay, so here's my reminder. You can only check primitive types and strings, um, but you can, you can do things, so an if-else statement will only execute up to one arm of the statement, potentially zero if I've got no else. So if I have an else, I'll always get one. A switch statement can actually bump through multiple ones, uh, depending on how you set it up. Um, so essentially what a switch, how a switch statement is executed, Java looks for a case, we'll look at one of these in the playground in a second. Java looks for a case that matches uh, the expression, and then it starts executing there. If you don't give it a brace statement, it'll actually fall through and execute a bunch of case statements. Okay, so let's, let's look at how this works. All right, so what's going to happen here? I've got a switch statement. I'm switching on the value of a variable called test. I have, so where am I gonna start? What's the value of test when the statement starts executing? Two. So which is the first letter I'm gonna print? C, but there's no break statement. So what's my program gonna do next? It's gonna print D, and then it's gonna print E. There you go. If I set this to be zero, I'll start all the way at the top. If I set it to be something like five, I'm just gonna get an E. Um, if I put a break in here anyway, and don't do this, this is gross, I would put it on a separate line, but I can stop at a certain point. So now, if I start at zero, I get through the A to B to C, but then I hit a break, which takes me out of the switch state. Okay, I don't wanna spend a huge amount of time on this. So on Friday, we're gonna do full-throated review with some problems, and we'll look at some of the code you guys have submitted and, and talk about things in preparation for the midterm next week. Do we have any questions? Now, before we talk, do a brief discussion of Java internals. Well, I guess it won't be brief, so it'll be the rest of the class. Anything else? Yeah. So, uh, so the question is, how does the switch statement get executed? So I start, I go from top to bottom. I look for a case that matches the variable that I'm testing. So here, I start here. This is case zero, the value of the variable I'm switching on is zero. And then I continue downward until I find a break, or I leave the, the switch statement. Does that make sense? So here what happened is I started at zero, I printed A, I kept going. I printed B, I kept going, I printed C, and then I hit a break statement. The break left the switch statement. So let's do, let's do a few more of these. These are a little tricky to understand. It's not something that you're gonna see very often. So this is just gonna print C, um, but if I start below the break statement, now I'll start to, uh, I'll start to print the bottom half of the expression. Other, good, good question. Other questions about these two new ideas, any of the imperative programming stuff that we have seen so far? Anything is fair game before I launch into Fun digression. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, people had asked about this. I don't even know if it's on. Thank you for the reminder. Is this is on. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yeah, please remind me about that in the future. I like to keep it as low as possible because I don't like to hear my voice when I'm talking, but. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do want people to be able to hear me in the back, so I'm sorry, I should've checked for that. All right, okay, so let's talk a little bit about what is actually happening when you run a Java program. So the kind of environments that we've prepared for you to use in this class, we've designed for learning purposes, and to do that, we've had to actually hide a lot of the details from you, and that's, in, that's intentional. I don't want you to worry about this stuff for the first couple weeks while you're just getting comfortable figuring out how to communicate with the computer at all. That's confusing enough. But let's look a little bit, and we're gonna talk, we'll actually see some of the details about 
what is actually happening. So when you submit your code to our playground, when you submit it to Prairie Learn, when you hit the play button or the grade button in IntelliJ, what is actually going on behind the scenes? And this is something that I hope will interest you. You know, as a computer scientist, there's, um, you know, I, I, I've always liked this about our field, is, uh, you know, the fact that you can simultaneously be a user, as I am of many things, and then when you get curious about them, you can actually find out a lot more about them. There's a lot of documentation out there about how things work. So a lot of times, the way you get drawn in, so for example, some of you may at some point decide to learn some machine learning, you're actually gonna get a chance to do a little bit of that later this semester. Um, when you start off with that, you're kind of a user of these tools. You're like, oh wow, there's this cool, you know, library from Google that I can use to do classification on this data set and then I can make predictions based on that, that's really cool. But then at some point, you're gonna start to wonder like, hey, what's actually happening? How is that actually work? And that's a good thing, and I encourage you to, you know, indulge yourself in some of that curiosity, right? You don't have to understand how everything that you use works. Uh, I mean, maybe someday you will, and that would be actually a pretty awesome place to be. Um, but, you know, start with things one at a time and, and, and dig into them a little bit. And again, computer science is such an open field that you can find out a lot about anything you want to learn about. Okay. And... This particular explanation may help uh, clear up some things that might have been confusing you up to this point about the kinds of error messages you're getting and why certain things work the way they do. Okay, and again, this is interesting. There's a, there's a, I was thinking about it on, uh, you know, on my ride here this morning. There is a book you could write uh, about that has to do with this, a little bit of the story that we're gonna talk about. Super, super interesting how, how some of this is involved. Okay. And again, I'm gonna try to avoid going into a, you know, mind-numbing amount of detail, but there are people who are involved in the class. I'm one of them, uh, Ben is another, and we have some other course developers as well who are deeply knowledgeable about the Java language. So if you have questions, please ask, and they will answer them in great detail, and you will learn a lot um, from learning a little bit about what they know. Okay, so let's talk about what actually happened. So you, you know, hit submit on Prairie Learn. You hit return or control return in our playground. What actually happened, okay? So roughly there are two steps. And we talked about this a little bit in lab, but I think it's worth reiterating. So the first thing that Java does is it takes the source code that you wrote, okay? So we talk, we talk about this, we refer to this as source code. And it performs a transformation that we refer to as compilation, okay? It compiles, there's a piece of software called the Java compiler. We're gonna run it in just a minute. You normally don't run it yourself. It gets run for you when you use IntelliJ behind the scenes or when you use Prairie Learn or whatever, but there is a piece of software called the Java compiler. And it performs this first step in the journey from you writing a piece of code to actually seeing what it causes the computer to do. And that first step is a transformation. Your code is not being executed, it is being transformed. And it's transformed into um, a format that we refer to as bytecode, Java bytecode, okay? Um, now, how many people have used like a language like C++ or C or something like that in the past? Okay. They teach that in high school now? Ooh. Okay, poor choices. Um, anyway, the, there are languages out there that actually where when you compile them, what you get is something that an actual computer processor can execute. And one of the really interesting things about Java that we're gonna come back to in a few minutes is that Java was one of the first widely adopted languages to produce, where the compiler produces something that you actually need another program to run, okay? So what you get out of the compiler is something called bytecode, but there is no computer processor out there that can run this bytecode. Instead, what you have to do, and, and if you get errors at this stage, they're called compilation errors, right? Um, if I can't compile your code, I can't run it. Okay, I'm ruining my flow here. Um, the next thing that happens is the code is actually executed. And again, there's actually another computer program here uh, that's called the Java Virtual Machine. We'll talk about why this was done in a minute. Okay, so, so again, the first thing I do is I run a program called the Java Compiler. We're gonna refer to it as Java C in a minute. That takes your source code and produces a different representation of it called bytecode. Then, 
this thing called the Java Virtual Machine, sometimes we run it as just Java, takes that bytecode and actually executes it. And again, you might be wondering, you know, okay, I don't know a lot about how computers work, but I know they've got this processor that's supposed to actually be able to execute instructions, so why would, it, why am I doing this two-step process? Or why do I have this thing called a virtual machine involved? And that's actually a really interesting part of the Java story that we'll, that we'll get to in a second. So any errors that occur when your program is actually executed are known as runtime errors, right? Um, you guys have seen a mixture of these already. So let's look at some, uh, you know, different types of compiler errors, okay? So the compiler can, can fail in a variety of different ways, right? So for example, if you give it something like this, right? Like this is a perfectly valid instruction, right? It's just not a perfectly valid instruction to the Java compiler, right? So if I try to run this, um, you know, essentially, this is the Java compiler throwing up its hands and being like, I have no idea what you want. Um, and any one of any number of weird things can go off. Because as you guys have been seeing, there's a very formalized, you know, agreement that we've made with the Java compiler about how we're going to communicate with it, and this violates all of that. I mean, there may be some day, there are people out there in the world working on this problem that are trying to get us to the point where we could actually have computer, um, you know, compilers and computer programming languages that would actually allow us to, uh, you know, execute instructions like this. That would be great, right? I wish there was a compiler where I could just say, please grade all of the MP0 checkpoint submissions right now, thank you very much, and it would just be done. But instead, you know, that takes us a couple weeks to do that. All right? Um, all right, so, and, and then, you know, there are other times, so actually this is still a compiler error, but it's a different kind of compiler error. So now, what you wrote is valid Java syntax, but the compiler identified a problem for you. And this is one place where the compiler helps. We'll talk about how compilers can help in a minute. So the compiler is not only gonna transform your code, but it can also find mistakes. So here, the mistake is that you told the compiler on the left side of this initialization that you were initializing a variable of type int. And on the right side, you used a string literal. And so the Java compiler is saying, I can't, you know, there's, there's a bug here already. I know this, I can't do this. I don't know how to convert, you know, either I have to change the type of the variable or I have to figure out a way to convert the string to an int and I don't know how to do those things. So I'm not going to. Okay? Now, despite the fact that the compiler can catch certain types of errors, what do you think is going to happen here? Okay, so this looks like really brain dead code, right? I have a variable called s that's a string. I initialize it to null. We talked about last time the fact that when if I have a null object, I can't do anything with it, including access its length property. So what's gonna happen here when I run this? Other than a lot of coughing. Man, are you guys all sick? Oof. If I get sick later this week, I'm blaming you, okay? <laughs> Collectively. Um, so what happened here? So this is our first example today of a runtime error. So the Java compiler actually compiled this code for us. And it was like, hey, go ahead, run it, see what happens, right? So you might wonder why. Right, so the compiler is a piece of computer software. And it would, it would seem to argue, I would use this as a case to say the Java compiler could do better, right? Why doesn't the Java compiler know that this is gonna cause a problem? It saw me initialize a string, like don't let your friends do this, right? I mean, it saw me initialize a string to null and then try to get its length method one line later. So really the compiler can't help with this? You know, that's, that's, so this is an interesting commentary on the Java language. You can do this. You can write a piece of code like this, compile it into an app, deploy it on the app store, and have it crash on your friend's phone, right, if you want to, right? There's nothing preventing you in Java from doing this, which is weird. Okay. Now, one of the things that's actually, that we as a community, programming community, have been trying to do your scientists have been trying to work on for a long time, is to figure out how to take these runtime errors and transform them into compiler errors. 
We talked about this a little bit before, but why is this? Who remembers? So there's two points at which I can have an error. I can have an error when I compile my code that's generated by the compiler, where the compiler identifies that there's something wrong, or I can have an error when the code is executed. So why would I like to try to take, so for example, I would like to take this runtime error, and I would like it if the compiler would be able to identify that for me. I would like the compiler to say, you know, no, 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 you can't do this. That variable's null, and you can't use it like this. So why, why is that beneficial? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, when does the code, so let, let's put it this way. Who compiles the code? Think about it that way. Who compiles the code? Like, you guys have apps on your phone. Let's, let's pick on Lyft. Maybe you have a Lyft app. There's some Lyft drivers around here. Who compiled that code? Somebody compiled that code. A human being. Who? Like, who compiled it? Anyone want to guess? I mean, if you actually know the real person, I'll be very impressed, right? Ten dollars if you can give me a name. Human being. I don't think so. Yeah. What's that? So the programmer compiled the code. What programmer? Where do they, like, where would you th assume they probably work? Lyft, right? Someone at Lyft built the app at some point. You know, they worked on it, they made a bunch of changes, as they were changing things, they were compiling the code, and then at some point they were like, okay, we need to release this, we've got some new features that we want people to, to experience, and so they compiled it into an app and they posted it on the App Store. So the people that compile the code are developers. They're compiling the code all the time. When you guys are working on the MP, you're compiling the code multiple times as you work. Every time you run the test suites, you may not realize this because again, Java's hide, you know, IntelliJ hides this from you. Every time you run the test suites, the code gets recompiled. So if there's a problem that the compiler can identify, it gets identified very quickly. So imagine that I wrote this code and I just messed up. You know, if the compiler could tell me right away, oh, by the way, this code is unsafe, that would be great, because I would fix it. Clearly, I didn't mean to do this. This is really dumb. So the code is being compiled by developers, and it gets compiled before it gets executed. Remember, if I can't compile it, I can't execute it. And so any bugs that I can move from runtime to compile time are bugs that a user is never going to experience. So that's awesome. If I get code into the wild that has bugs, it's gonna crash in front of a user. So developers compile the code, users run the code. So developers are the ones that fix compiler errors, users are the ones that experience these runtime errors that manifest themselves as crashes or freezes or all sorts of other bad stuff, right? So the more of those runtime errors you can identify when you're compiling and developing the code, the fewer your users are gonna experience, which is awesome. So again, I'll come back to this question, why does Java let me do this, okay? This may seem like a small matter to you, but I, uh, to me this is a big problem, okay? I am ashamed that in 2019, the Java compiler will allow me to do this, right? This is wrong, you know, this should, this, this should not be okay. Now, let me, let's, let's, let's introduce ourselves to the Java compiler, so hold on a sec, I'm gonna, Switch to my desktop. Oops, let's see here. Cross my tab. I'm gonna cross my desktop. Let's do that. Share. Desktop. All right, awesome. So I'm gonna open up. So this is um, the uh, sort of programmer power tool that the um, that, that was introduced in coders in the last chapter. This is the command line. So I'm gonna use this environment to actually, you know, this is the sort of the lowest level at which, one of the lowest levels at which you can interact with your computer. So I'm gonna use this environment to show you what's actually happening behind the scenes when we compile and run Java code. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually run this program called the Java compiler. So what I did is I typed Java C that's a program, and if I run it without any arguments, it's gonna give me all of this information about how to use it, okay? So now my screen is full of all sorts of 
information that would be useful to me if I was actually using this on a regular basis. Now again, most of the time you will never run the Java compiler. Instead, IntelliJ will run it for you, Prayer Learner will run it for you, something else will run it for you. But it's there. It exists. It's a program. All right, so let's compile some code. All right, so I'm gonna uh, edit a file called example.java. I'm gonna put some Java code in here. Let's see what happens. Okay. So now what I'm doing is I'm running the compiler and I'm telling it, I want you to compile the code that's inside this file. I want you to compile the contents of this file example.java. If I try this, I'm gonna see that there's a problem, okay? And this is one of the things that we've been hiding from you up until this point. We're gonna stop hiding that next week, but for now, we've been allowing you to write code that isn't actually valid Java code. Because in Java, the compiler is, will require that we put the code that we want to run not only into a class, but into a method inside that class. Okay, so the thing that starts on line two should look familiar to you. This is a method. Now there are some things about this method that will be unfamiliar. You haven't seen static before. We're gonna get there. But void is what I write when a method doesn't return any arguments. The name of this method is main. It takes a single argument called unused, which I named because I don't use it, and that argument is an array of strings, okay? So let's see what happens now. Assuming I did things correctly, I'm gonna run the compiler again. Okay. So, one of the fun things, and this is maybe like one of those psychological things about being a computer scientist, a lot of times when you run a program and it succeeds, this is what happens. Nothing. There's no like, congratulations, you compiled your code. Nope. It's just like, I got nothing to say. I just did what you wanted. Don't bother me again, but we will. Um, what I want to show you is that what happened is that it created this other file. So remember, we said the compiler takes my Java code. So let me display the contents of example.java. That's the Java source code that I started with. And it transforms it into a different representation. That different representation is called bytecode. Bytecode is what's in this other file. Now, I don't want to display the contents of that file to you the way I did here because you wouldn't be able to read it. It's only readable by a computer, but Java comes with a special program for displaying the contents of what are called class files. And this is it. Can we have one conversation here, ladies? Thanks. Um, all right, so here's, here's the bytecode that was actually produced. Now this has been printed, displayed in a way to help us make sense of it, but I don't, I don't expect you to understand this. I just wanna show you a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, okay? <laughs> so this is what's, this is the contents of the bytecode inside that class file formatted in a way to try to help us understand. Um, these, remember, uh, well actually I didn't tell you this, so what bytecode consists of is a series of simpler instructions that are then run by the Java virtual machine, okay? And here are the instructions over here. Um, I'm not gonna, we don't have anywhere close enough time to explain what these are, um, but this is that second representation of your code. So you started off with the source code that was Java source code, and now this is the Java bytecode, okay? And now I have a program I can run. So I'm, now I'm gonna use this second program that I told you about. So again, just like Java C, I have a second program called just Java. So Java C is the Java compiler, just Java is the Java virtual machine. And you'll see, just like Java C, if I run it on its own, it gives me lots of arguments about how I can run it in different ways. Like I said before, not a program you're gonna typically run on your own. Instead, it's gonna be run for you by IntelliJ or something like that. But I can now actually run my code. So here's the format for doing that. Oh, mad at me about something. Got to back and fix this. Oh, I didn't, it's not public. Yeah, all right. I'm gonna add one more modifier to this. Oh, I wanna show you something. Okay, so I just modified the source code to fix this problem that occurred when I ran it. 
All right, so now I'm gonna run it again, but I'm still getting the same problem. So I'm like, I just fixed that. Why is this happening? Yeah. Yeah, so I skipped that first step. I've changed the source code, but I haven't changed the byte code. And so I need to rerun that step of compiling my code. And again, this is all done behind the scenes for you. When you run the test suites on IntelliJ, roughly what's happening is the compile, IntelliJ runs the compiler, that produces a bunch of bytecode, and then as a separate step, it runs Java and executes the code in the test suites that then runs some tests on your code and figure out what happened. That's basically what's going on. So now, I can run my program. So now I've run the Java compiler, that first step, Java C, and I've also run this second piece of software called Java. Now, I, I just wanna make sure that we're clear about one thing. Both Java and Java C are software. These are computer programs written by human beings. No, nothing magical about them. I don't think they're written in Java. I think they were written in like C++ or something like that. Um, but, but this is how this works. Okay. All right, so we did the Java C and we did the Java. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this bytecode was one of the innovative features of Java when the language was introduced. It was this idea that in the past, the compiler would produce code that was directly executable by a computer processor. Java was one of the first widely executed, uh, widely sort of deployed languages that, that produced this other representation. And this was unusual at the time, okay? So Java produces bytecode, why? Does anyone know what the reason for this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the reason for this is the following. And this was more true at the time that Java came out. So it used to be, does anyone, let's see how old people are in here. Does anyone remember uh, when Mac started using Intel processors in their laptops? Does anyone remember that happening? I can identify anyone here who's like older than 30, <laughs> right? Um, or maybe you guys read about it. I mean, it wasn't, it was a long time ago, but there was a period of time where the computer processor that ran inside Apple computers was different than the computer processor that ran inside in, uh, Windows computers and other types of computers. And so the problem was, if you compiled a program on a Windows PC, and you tried to send it to your friend who had a Mac, it wouldn't run. It was like written in a different language. You can think of the two processors as speaking two completely different languages. One of them spoke Intel x86, the other one spoke PowerPC. So if you take something that I wrote in Intel x86 and try to read it to a PowerPC processor, it's just like, I have no idea what's going on. And so bytecode was designed to solve that problem. So I could actually take this compiled piece of code that I just created. So if I go back here, this example.class file. I could take that file and I could send it to you, anyone in this room, and you could run it on your computer. You would do the same thing I just did. You would say Java, and then you would tell it where to find the bytecode. And so this was, at the time, the real selling point behind Java, and it was the design decision that really created a lot of, you know, it was the design decision that motivated a lot of the other features of Java. Um, so this was their slogan, write once, run anywhere. So the idea was any developer to write a program, compile it on their machine, and then send it to anyone in the world who could run it as long as they had that program, Java, the Java virtual machines. How many people have ever been prompted to like update Java, you know, you need to update your runtime? That's what it's doing. You have that program installed. Does anyone else know where that program is installed? Probably the most common place that that Java program is installed. Java is installed in a lot of computers but it's installed on one type of computer in particular, of which there are billions out there in the world. A lot of you have one. Maybe you didn't know it. Anyone know what it is? It's a particular kind of device that runs Java that is probably responsible for sort of saving the Java programming language for the last decade or so. What is it? Yeah. Android smartphone. 
Every single Android smartphone runs Java. The programs that you write in this class are written in Java because they're going to be compiled to Java bytecode that is then able to be run on any one of the four or five billion Android phones out there. Right? So when, when you might have seen commercials or, I don't know, maybe you, did get, you see different ads than I do, but, you know, uh, Sun likes to brag about how many devices run Java. There's like, you know, 10 billion devices in the world that run Java. I think like five billion of those are Android phones. Um, and so that is one of the places uh, where, where people are, are running this. Okay, I just settled this. Awesome. All right. So, one of the things that's happened, so let's fast forward to the future now. So now we know a little bit about how Java works. But the Java language and the Java compiler are quite old. Um, and one of the things that's been happening is compilers are computer software. Every single piece of computer software has been riding this incredible wave of increasing speed and power for the past couple of decades. You know, you guys have lived through this. This is one of those things that I think it's almost impossible to appreciate. It's like trying to think about the age of the universe. It's like, I know it's like billions of years, but I have no way of understanding that time scale as a human being. It's just too dissimilar from the time scales I'm used to. The increase in computer performance in the, in the time that you've been alive and the time that I've been alive is just flabbergasting. There's no way to wrap your mind around it, right? I mean, when people say the phone in your pocket is as powerful as data centers were, supercomputers were 20 or 30 years ago, that's actually true. It's not an exaggeration, right? People say this about all sorts of things, right? But it's actually true about computers. It's stunning. So one of the things that's getting faster and more powerful should be those compilers. That's an important tool for you if you're a programmer. The more the compiler can do, the better um, it can help you out. And Java, finally, lately, has started to uh, make some changes to the compiler that might interest you. Let me show you one of them, okay? So this is actually valid Java code. How many people knew that? Okay, APCS apparently hasn't realized that there's Java 10 out, okay? Um, what is going on here? Okay, so this looks like a variable declaration and initialization. Based on the right side, I feel like it's an integer, but I don't see an integer here. I see this thing called var. And maybe if I've written some JavaScript, this is bringing back bad memories, bad old days of JavaScript. But um, this is valid Java code, okay? So what is happening here? So this is one of the, uh, this is just one example of one place where the Java compiler is starting to do more for you. It's starting to help you out. Why can I do this? Let me ask you this question. So up until now, we would have had to say int integer value is equal to five. But why can I replace that int with this placeholder? I can do the same thing with the double. If I replace the right side with the double, or a character, or a string, this works fine. I don't have to change the var. Why is that possible? Who can explain this to me? So normally in Java, I have to tell, when I'm initializing a variable, I just have to tell the compiler what the type is. But why don't I have to do that anymore? And this is not just a feature in Java. A lot of programming languages now have this feature. So thank you. It's super useful. Why don't I have to tell? So again, normally I would have to say, um, let's see here, th this works, right? So normally up here, I would have to say, int i is equal to zero, int sum is equal to zero, that works fine, but I can also replace that with var. Works fine. Why don't I have to tell the compiler what the type is? How, what is it doing? It's helping me out. It's making my life easier. Who can explain this? Yeah. So, yeah, basically. So let me, let me go back to the first example that was sort of what I showed you when we started the class, right? If you look at this carefully, you'll realize that I'm actually telling Java what the type of sum is twice. I'm telling it on the left side as part of the declaration, but I'm also telling it on the right side because I'm initializing it with an integer literal. And so, this var keyword in Java 10 
allows the compiler to do what's called local type inference. The compiler can infer what the type of sum is because I'm initializing it with an integer literal. So the compiler says, okay, you're trying to stump me here. Use this bare keyword, not exactly sure. I'm used to being told more about what to do, but I'm gonna play along. So I see that you have a variable called sum, and I see that you want me to figure out, I'm supposed to guess what the, what the type is. All right, well, I have a big clue here, which is that you've initialized it to an int literal. So I'm gonna assign it to be an int, yeah. No, Python just doesn't have types at all, basically. Yeah, Python is like, whatever, you know. Um, actually, that, actually, sorry, that's not true. Um, py in Python, a variable, the type of variable could be changed at any point, right? So in Python, I can do, you know, people that are Python programmers, I can do this, basically. I could say int sum is equal to zero, and then I could say, oh, changed my mind, I want it to be a string now. And I can do this. Is that a good idea? Having written a lot of code in both languages, I kind of want the best of both worlds, and we're actually getting closer to being able to have that. Um, but yeah, so Python does have types internally. In Python, the type of a variable can change at any point in the program, right? So there's no guarantees that it's still going to be, you know, even if I initialize it with an int, there's no guarantees it's still gonna be an int later. Okay, so let me point out one thing. If I don't give the compiler enough information, then this local type inference will fail. So this is not going to work, right? And the reason is, it says cannot infer variable type for this variable, because I didn't give it a clue. I didn't initialize it, right? So it says there's no initialization here, so I'm stumped, right? And I think, actually, the Java 10 compiler is still dumb enough that, yeah, even if I, like, assign it in a minute, it doesn't, it, it, this isn't enough of a clue for it, right? So I literally have to have a literal value as part of the initialization for it to work. Okay. Let me briefly talk about uh, this main method. We'll come back to this next week because we're gonna start seeing it in our examples. So when I wrote, when I needed to write that valid piece of Java code, you probably might have noticed quickly two things. There were two things I had to do to get it to work. One is that I had to wrap it in a class, and we're gonna talk about objects next week. But we've been hiding that from you on purpose. The second thing was, I had to use this very specific name for the function. I had to call it public static void main, and it had to take a string, an array of string arguments. So why is this? What is the main method? So in a Java program, you might think, when I run a Java program, where does it start running? How does it know where to start? I might have 10 different methods. How does it know what the first line of code it runs should be? After it starts running somewhere, then it's gonna run, it's gonna run your loops and your if-else statements and it's called your functions and whatever, but I have to start somewhere, right? And in Java, this is the entry point for Java programs. Somewhere in your Java program, you need to have a function called main. It has to have this signature, and that's what's going to launch everything else. If it's an app, when that function starts, that, but that function needs to draw the display and start communicating with the network and wait for users to do things and blah, 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 right? So this is the, uh, this is the entry point. Um, okay, so every Java program has to start in a main method somewhere. The, the second question, and I'll just leave this as an exercise for, for the listener, um, is why does it get past an array of arguments? And why are they strings? Okay, any questions about this? Before we wrap up, we might be done a few minutes early, which is okay. There's an exam in here at, at 11. What's that? How do you fix the runtime error? So a runtime error usually is there's something wrong with your code, you need to modify the code, right? How do you, I, but here's, here's a better question. How do you identify, how do you make sure that users, what's one tool that we're using already in the MP to make sure that users don't see errors? What are you guys doing all day long if you work on the MP? Test suites, yeah. So testing is a huge part of modern software development. Like, you know, when you write an app at a big company, they're not just like, oh, you know, you wrote, like, you know, Trevor wrote some changes in, let's just push it out tomorrow and see what happens, right? If you were Netscape, that's what you did. But most companies now have a really rigorous testing process before things actually go live. All right, so 
Look, I just want to, you know, close with some words of encouragement. This is a, this is a tough point in the semester. I understand that. In addition to all the coughing, I guess you guys are all sick as well, which is, which is rough. Um, you know, don't give up over the next week or so. You have a midterm, you have MP0 that's due, um, you got some homework problems. This is as hard as the imperative programming part of the class is gonna get. So just hang in there, you know, keep putting one foot in front of the other, you guys are gonna be fine. All right, you're gonna get to the midterm, you're gonna do great, prepare for it uh, the way that you would, finish up MP0. Okay, so on Monday, we turn the page and we start talking about objects. On Friday, I will be here for one last discussion of imperative programming and midterm review. So that's what we do on Friday. We're back here. I'm not gonna have much of an agenda. I'm basically gonna be here to take questions. We'll go through some practice problems together. Um, anything I can do to help you prepare for the midterm. MP0 is due on your deadline day this weekend. Um, office hours are open today and tomorrow. Great day to come in, it's very quiet. I will see you on Friday. Please try to leave quickly. There is an exam in here at 12.